My dear brothers and sisters, I bring you grace and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You all sounded really good on Beautiful Savior. You make a nice choir. So if you look at the top of your bulletin, you'll see that today is called Transfiguration Sunday, of course, because we read the story of the Transfiguration where Jesus is transfigured, he's made white on the top of a mountain, and Moses and Elijah appear, and Peter, James, and John are there. It also has other names, this Sunday does. Among them, has anyone ever heard this one? Quinquagesima Sunday? Anyone? Oh, yeah, some of Any others over here? Maybe one, and, oh, a couple? Okay. Um, Quinquagesima just means 50, because we're 50 days before Easter. Um, it's also known as Shrove Sunday, and tomorrow Shrove, or Shrove Sunday, tomorrow Shrove Monday, then there's Shrove Tuesday, also known as Mardi Gras or Fat Tuesday. My favorite uh, title for the Sunday is The Sunday Next Before Lent. I'm not quite sure why I put the or words in that order, but I love that. Um, Pastor Matheson, after last hour, said we should just call it Alleluia Sunday because we say goodbye to the word Alleluia. All of those are ways of saying this is the last Sunday before Lent begins, okay? So I want to lift up a couple of questions about our reading for today. Again, it's the reading of the Transfiguration. The first is, why would we read the story of the Transfiguration right before Lent? And the second is, how does the Transfiguration function for the disciples and therefore uh, for us 2,000 years later as Jesus' uh, disciples here and now? So the first question, why do we read the story of the Transfiguration on the Sunday before Lent? And to understand that, um, you need to back up just a little bit in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, I'm on page 919. You don't have to open your Bibles, but if you'd like to follow along, you certainly can. 919, this is uh, chapter, starting in chapter 8, verse 27. So before the Transfiguration, before the event of the Transfiguration, there's another very famous encounter between Jesus and his disciples. And here is a description of that event. This is verse 27 again. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. And he, Jesus, asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter, and again, this is a very famous uh, confession, a famous response. Peter answered him, you are the Messiah, okay? And then we're told Jesus sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. So the disciples have just, through Peter, acknowledged their instinct that this is the Messiah, and the next thing that happens is really important, because Jesus now starts to explain to them what that means, what the Messiah has come to do. And I'm reading, again, directly from the Gospel. This is verse 31. Again, Peter has just confessed, you are the Messiah. Then Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man, the Messiah, must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed and after three days rise again. I cannot overstate strongly enough how confusing this was to the disciples. And in fact, in the next line, basically what they are saying to Jesus is, Okay, Jesus, we've just accepted that you're the Messiah. We love you very much. You're a wonderful teacher. We think you're great. But you are a little misguided about what this whole Messiah thing means. Let us help explain to you who and what the Messiah is, what the Messiah does. The Messiah is a political leader. He's a military leader. He's come to free us. The Messiah hasn't come to die, right? And Jesus, we're told, sternly uh, responds to them, turning and looking at his disciples, Peter, or Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on human things, but, or, or not on divine things, but on human things. So again, there's this event where Peter confesses Jesus as the Messiah. Jesus begins to explain what that means, and the disciples are thoroughly and totally and completely confused because now they are forced to sit with this new information and think, what does this mean? How, is, how does that make any sense at all, okay? And this is, I'm gonna suggest, 
how, why we read this passage right before we start Lent, which is a period of what? what? When we also sit as followers of Jesus with the question, who is this Messiah? And what has he come to do? And what does it mean that he has come to give his life for us? Does that make sense? Feel free to nod your heads. <laughs> All right. So that's the answer sort of the first question. Why do we read the transfiguration story now? And it's because of what happens right before it. The disciples are sitting with that question. We're about to begin to sit with that question in a new way. Now the second question. How does it function? And as always, this is not, I'm not suggesting this is the only way we can read the transfiguration. It's not exhaustive, but I think it's a helpful way to understand what's going on. I think part of what's happening here is God is looking at the disciples, recognizing their confusion, their misunderstanding, their concern, all of the questions they have about what this Messiah thing, who's now going to die, means. And God is giving them, let's call it a grace, of saying, I want to show you something to reassure you, to comfort you, to help you recognize who Jesus is, and to trust in that Jesus, despite what he's just said about this sort of crazy thing about dying and being raised from the dead. Thus, the transfiguration, right? Which helps, as the, the Jesus is, you know, disclosed on the mountaintop, bright white, shining in all his glory, that revelation and the presence of Moses and Elijah helps to affirm for the disciples who Jesus is. It reassures them. It gives them a sense of trust. Okay, we don't really understand what's going on, but this makes, helps to make us, help, help us to take the next step. Does that make sense? Has anyone here ever had questions about how they're going to step into the future? <laughs> Just a few hands. Is it helpful to get reassurances that help you to take that next step? Okay, that's what's going on here. Now, here's the really important point. Does that event, I mean, it's only Moses and Elijah on a mountaintop, and it's only Jesus shining like the sun. Does that event answer all of the questions for the disciples for the rest of their lives? No. How do I know that? Read the rest of the Gospel of Mark. Or read one of the verses that comes right after the transfiguration event. Here's, this is still, this is within verses of the transfiguration event. You know, the cloud has left. Moses and Elijah have disappeared. Uh, it's just the disciples and, and, and Jesus there. And we're told this, verse 9. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. I love this little scene because it's so easy to imagine the disciples here. They've just had this transfiguration experience. They're walking down the mountain, and Jesus says, hey, just keep this to yourself until after I've risen from the dead. And you can see the disciples looking at Jesus saying, oh, right, yes, sir, <laughs> we'll do that. And then Jesus walks on ahead, and they turn to each other, and they say, what is he talking about? <laughs> I don't understand anything he's saying. It says, verse 10, so they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead could mean. So the transfiguration helps to reassure them, but it doesn't answer all of their questions. One of the reasons I love this story, other stories like it in the Bible, is I think it resonates with our own experience, right? Now, how does that impact us today? I want to suggest two things. The first is I think God, in the same way that God is showing a grace to the disciples through this transfiguration event, trying to say, it's going to be okay, I'm with you, trust Jesus, I think God again and again and again in our lives is trying to say something similar. In the words of the gospel today, this is my beloved son, listen to him. Trust him. He will be with you. He will accompany you into the future. And so one of the reasons we come to a place like this week in and week out is to hear that word of affirmation, to hear that word of confidence, that, that word that gives us a sense of hope about how we're invited into the future. 
I want to suggest as Christians, though, it's not just worship. We're also called as Christians outside of this place to keep an eye out for other ways God may be speaking to us, usually gently, usually quietly. And if you're thinking to yourself, well, it needs to be louder for me to get it. I mean, I would love to have a transfiguration event. Remember, even that event for the disciples didn't answer all of their questions, right? So just because it's a bigger event doesn't mean it's better. So I would suggest look for the ways that God is trying to reassure you, trying to give you a sense of hope, trying to lead you into the future. And one of the ways you can do that, you can calibrate your eyesight or your heart sight for that, is by looking to the past, right? The disciples don't have any idea what Jesus is talking about in this passage. They will come to understand it later, after Easter, when they're looking backwards. So I would suggest look to your past, reflect on times when you've had a challenge or a struggle or been praying for something, and reflect on how has God showed up to answer that prayer. I think we're really good in the moment at asking God for things or praying about things. We're not as good often as looking in the back, back or the rearview mirror and recognizing the ways that God has shown, shown up. All of that is a way of saying, as Christians, we are called to listen to God's voice, to hear God's voice, to trust God, okay? The second thing is don't underestimate your ability, each and every one of you, to be the kind of sign, the kind of gesture, the kind of word of hope that someone in your life needs so that they can be reassured about the path that they're on, or maybe to question their path, so that they can be reassured about taking the next step of faith. God not only wants to give you a sense of hope and promise for the future, he wants to use you to give it to others also. So let's pray about that. Good and loving God, we thank you for this Sunday called Transfiguration, when you reveal yourself to your disciples in a new way. We pray you will open our eyes to know that you are with us. We pray you will help us to hear your voice and trust you and follow you. And we pray that you will use us to be a beacon of light for others. In all this we pray in the holy name of Jesus. Amen.